Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. Survey says, know your donors, it pays to ask. My name is Jen Lennon. I'm a Senior Marketing and Communications Coordinator for the Stelter Company. I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Nathan Stelter. But before I do, I'd like to just say a few words about our webinar series. As an industry leader in plan giving marketing, Stelter is committed to providing innovative solutions and education for our industry. We're very happy to host this complimentary webinar today, as well as a whole slate of webinars throughout the year. Today's webinar is our fifth in the 2018 curriculum. We have four more scheduled for 2018. Uh, one of them, the next one actually, is coming up in one week from today. I think it's a topic and a presenter you'll all agree uh, will be very beneficial. It will be with Dr. Russell James, and he will be uh, doing his webinar on some new research he just completed, the title being Why Cash is Not King in Fundraising, Results from One Million Nonprofit Tax Returns. So again, that's one week from today at noon, and you can register, go to our website, Seltzer.com backslash webinars to register for that. Uh, and also, we saw that he's on the call, so thank you so much for joining us today, Russell. Uh, some other topics we'll be doing later this year, we'll have some email insights and trends from our own experts here at Seltzer in September, and then we'll have some tips for creating standard performance metrics for charitable gift planners with Joe Bull later this year. Again, invites will be sent out as each webinar approaches, or you can visit our webinar page on stelter.com backslash webinars to register today. Also on our webinar page is a library of webinar recordings that are free for everyone to enjoy. So back to our presentation today, survey says, I'm excited to introduce Nathan Stelter. Nathan is the vice president at the Stelter Company. His responsibilities include product development, strategic partnerships, marketing consultation, client services, and corporate marketing. His primary concentration is to oversee Stelter's consulting and marketing teams. He assists our regional marketing consultants to develop distinct marketing solutions that meet each nonprofit's unique plan giving needs. Nathan's expertise places him in demand as a lecturer at national and regional industry meetings on topics such as gift planning, marketing trends, relationship building skills, and cutting edge donor and fundraising research. Nathan has just been elected to the 2019 Board of Directors for the National Association of Charitable Gift Planners. He will serve a three-year term, which begins in January of 2019. He's a past board member of the National Capital Gift Planning Council in Washington, D.C., and he's a current member of the Mid-Iowa Plan Giving Council. Nathan is a graduate of the University of Iowa with a BA in uh, Marketing. And when he's not working, Nathan enjoys spending time with his family, doing CrossFit, playing soccer, which he said he played three games already this week, uh, bicycling, and of course, he's a loyal Hawkeye fan. He and his wife, Nora, live in Des Moines, Iowa with their three children, Ben, Brody, and Bren. Thanks so much, Nathan, for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Jen. I feel like we probably need to shorten that bio. It seems a little long, but I uh, appreciate it nonetheless. And uh, happy everybody's joining us here on a, well, at least a balmy uh, Wednesday in July here in uh, lovely Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, wanted to uh, spend some time sharing some information uh, that uh, actually one of your peers had asked me to compile and, and put together uh, for the conversation. Um, or for actually one of your conferences for one of the regional conferences just this past spring. So while this presentation is, is relatively new, uh, the, the, the idea uh, and uh, the implementation of surveys is, is most definitely not. Uh, in fact, as I was doing some research for the survey, looking back through some of the archives and some of the uh, materials that we've done over our, our 60 uh, or a 59 year history was actually looking uh, and found, I think our first survey, which was back in the, uh, the, the mid 1980s. So we know these have been around quite a bit, but uh, more and more we've seen them surface specifically in our space, in the plan giving world. And so, uh, you know, the reason we're, we're here today is, uh, you know, yeah, we're seeing more interest. Uh, I think today's uh, individual uh, donor, consumer uh, is inclined to give and provide feedback, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, there's more tools available to to gather and to access information. So we'll walk through some of that today. Uh, as as always with a webinar series, um, feel free to uh, type in some of your questions. Jen will be capturing those throughout, and we will uh, try to address those either throughout the presentation or most definitely towards the end. 
Uh, so start us off uh, just kind of uh, the the evolution of surveys. There's definitely been a long history, and yes, that is an individual with a selfie stick, uh, of the use and 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 uh, uh, application of surveys and that concept throughout the years, We're going back as far as ancient Egypt when they used surveys to determine number of subjects that they would govern. Uh, Roman emperors used to use surveys to determine levels of taxation, and even the Middle Ages using surveys uh, to really understand. Uh, the living conditions and number of uh, the parishioners and the serfs uh, within their uh, within their areas. So for today's day, uh, you know, how did we really get here? How did we get to uh, surveys and 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 the popular or the uh, popularity that they they are in today's age? Agricultural mapping really is where some of that started. I bring that up. Uh, the great folks at Iowa State University are just about 45, 30 minutes up the road from us here, uh, and we're actually uh, part of one of the first ag studies uh, in the country. Uh, one that we're probably all very familiar with is the Gallup poll started back in 1935, Nielsen ratings back in 1947 uh, as as a tool to uh, rank and rate uh, radio programs. And then probably the most popular one that uh, we're familiar with uh, starting really back in 1790, uh, the largest and most well-known is the U.S. Census, uh, which we'll be going back down that road here in uh, two years. Uh, so really more and more we're seeing these, whether they're a a formal survey like I just mentioned or one of those tools or even some of these that you're probably seeing in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, they can be short, they can be long, uh, they can be qualitative or quantitative. Uh, we see them in a lot of different formats, phone, mail, email, text, uh, social media. Uh, and you most definitely can set them up to be scientific or even just uh, more opinion surveys. Uh, in fact, as I was uh, putting this uh, presentation together, uh, I, I one of my uh, emails popped up and it happened to be my bank uh, surveying us about a new product that they were interested in. So you're seeing a lot of these different applications through our day-to-day -day life already. Uh, probably some of you see, I've seen these variations uh, from Target or any other uh, online consumer that you utilize. Uh, there tends to be a need more and more and, and for profits are not dissimilar from nonprofits in this space for continual feedback and to provide a loop on how are we doing? Uh, what does that experience from a client or a donor experience look like? And what type of loyalty, you know, for Target, you know, what brand loyalty do they have or for us an organizational loyalty? Uh, so actually, as I was doing this, just to share something else, uh, I think the first presentation I gave was in New York back in May. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, about a week after I gave that presentation, I received my own survey. Uh, back from them on exactly how my experience was. Uh, about a week later, I was attempting to give it to the good folks up at the Chesapeake Plain Giving Council in Baltimore. Got stranded in Atlanta, so sat in the Delta Sky Club and gave a go to meeting. And right after that go to meeting finished, sure enough, go to meeting popped up a quick survey. Uh, so we're seeing these more and more. And so that's the reason we're going to spend the next uh, 40, 45 minutes kind of diving into that a little deeper. Uh, before we start, just we get this question uh, quite a bit, and really just to clarify, you know, what is the difference really between survey, surveying and polling? Uh, both are definitely widely used. Typically see polling obviously more in political uh, situations because it, it is really very much designed to work around a single question, uh, asking a question a certain way. Surveying allows us uh, to look at a variety of questions, a uh, set of questions using different ways to capture that information, open-ended, uh, multiple choice, what have you. So for all intents and purposes, not not going to spend any time on polling today, but very much uh, that is the difference between those two. Uh, so really, why now? Uh, why are a lot of us, and, and many of you probably uh, on, on the call today, looking at, you know, how do you engage donors in a little different way? Uh, plain giving, especially as a survey has become a better tool in, in this space, plain giving has largely been a, a one-way, kind of a single dialogue uh, marketing uh, for years and years between print, between websites, between email. Uh, it is very much us putting information out there. Survey really allows us to open that up for more of a two-way dialogue and engage folks uh, in, in kind of where they're at. Uh, there's more and more competition for donor attention and for those dollars, so we're seeing need to differentiate ourselves and understand more of, of what is making our donors click and what are ways we can engage with them. Uh, and I really like utilizing surveys to allow us to be more efficient or effective in our day-to-day -day work. We'd all like to be out visiting the donors more, spending more time visiting with them, and, and really doing some of that, uh, that important relationship building. And so surveys can serve as a tool, as kind of a discovery tool, uh, maybe not dissimilar from what you do face-to-face -face already. 
Uh, some of the other things that we've seen also where surveys have, have, have been uh, very well received in, in our space is it helps get a better gauge of your donor base uh, based on their perception around national trends. You know, we tend to see uh, anecdotally, we see the, the localization uh, aspect of giving and just our day to day buying local, growing local. Uh, you know, is that impacting our donor psyche? Is that something from a engagement standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, we need to be mindful of? Uh, we shared this information with a, a large national organization a couple of years ago, uh, and the, the comment was, well, we're, we're a national organization. How does that really impact us? It was actually the good folks out of the United States Olympic Committee uh, in Colorado Springs. We said, all right, as a loyal Iowan, can you tell us how many uh, athletes, this is pre-Rio Games, are you sending to the, uh, the games this year? And I said, sure. Uh, you know, three or four uh, was, was uh, I believe, the response. Can you do that for all 50 states? Yes. So the idea is really to get it down to the lowest common denominator, and that looks different for every organization. Uh, so looking at, you know, are your donors inclined to think more that way? You know, are they looking uh, from other national trends of, of leaving fewer organizations in their plans? You know, we, plan giving, as we all know, is largely grown on the back of a silent generation, a generation where we see estates coming in that we, we typically see eight, nine, ten uh, provisions to charities. Uh, you know, both with the downturn about 10 years ago in the recession, uh, as well as some other studies that Black Bought and others have commissioned, we're seeing uh, the older generation, mature silent generation, as well as boomers leaving fewer, uh, which is good for us that are included, but also it means that there's more competition to stay in those. So what are your donor perceptions as it relates to some of those national trends? But ultimately, it's around it pays to ask. Uh, I think we, all of us that have been in the space, whether it's been a couple months or a couple years, uh, have, have stories that we've seen either firsthand or heard through others uh, that really resonate with us. And I know when I joined uh, this, uh, this great industry uh, just about 18 years ago, one of the first stories that resonated with me was around a YMCA and uh, the conversation uh, that was had between the executive director and, and a widow of a member who had just passed, a member who had been there 35, 40 plus years. And the state had been realized, gifts had been handed out to the local church, the local hospital, and nothing was left for the why. And then through conversations with the widow, the conversation pretty much uh, went uh, from a response standpoint, we didn't know that was an option, nobody ever asked. And so surveys really allow us, as we all have portfolios and are trying to manage those groups of folks, how do we put a little broader uh, uh, reach out there? How do we identify folks that maybe suspects or may have certain indicators that look like prospects, but we don't have staff time or bandwidth to really reach out. Uh, with surveys, we tend to see upwards of the 10-12% response rates. So we're seeing a lot of engagement for folks to give us information, but ultimately it allows us really an easy window to meet people where they're at to, to share that information. So for today's purposes, uh, really have kind of five points that we'll walk through from an agenda standpoint. Uh, broke this down into it's, it's five learning objectives, looking at uh, some use cases. There's obviously a lot of different use cases for surveys. Today, we'll really look at five that we've seen that really apply or pertain to the space that we live in, fundraising and play giving. Uh, we'll also look at, you know, how do you set objectives? What are those objectives that are important to think through when you're putting a, your plans together? It's, very, it's critical to, to think through that, uh, what you want to accomplish, because it informs the audience, it in, informs the formatting, and it informs the messaging. Looking at who, uh, we'll get that question on, who's we want. Uh, looking at best practices as it relates to creating the survey. Uh, I know some questions that came in already pre-webinar uh, this morning are on uh, messaging and cadence and are there good times, uh, best times to send surveys and so forth. So look at that a little bit. And then ultimately, like anything, it's not worth doing if you don't have a plan to follow up. Uh, the worst thing you can do uh, with, with any survey is and get uh, a donor engaged, get them to spend some time, and then never follow up with them. So being mindful of what does that look like as well. So to kind of start us off looking at those use cases that I mentioned, uh, we'll start with the first one that we uh, typically have seen. Um, this is really around donor engagement, donor involvement, giving opportunities to provide feedback. We first saw this uh, really, even though our first survey was back in the, the mid 80s, saw this about six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, we saw this with regards to how we repositioned, and as an example here on your screen, how we're repositioning uh, the, the last thing a typical donor would see before thinking of connecting with you. 
uh, which is typically your reply card. Uh, we, we, we started toying around, the example you see on the screen is just reframing the ask to connect around a 30 second survey, asking some of the very similar questions that we always ask, but reframing it. Now we saw response rates go up. Uh, we then looked at a two minute survey, uh, asking a little different uh, 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 questions to provide information and insight, uh, then expanded that to a half page and a full page that would accompany the marketing piece and continue to see more engagement and more, more response. So that really led us to, to think, you know, how do we do this? What are ways that we can engage and build these out to be more targeted, more relevant, more fruitful uh, for the donor, but also for, for the organizations? Uh, here's a couple examples of how the idea of surveying is being used by others, not in a full-fledged survey uh, format, but just ways that you can adapt it to some of your other marketing outreach that you're already doing. On the uh, left side there, the good folks at Adasa, you know, using the idea uh, of surveying and asking for feedback to uh, open the, the, the dialogue around how you want those dollars used, where would those have an impact. We're seeing that more and more obviously generation by generation of people wanting to see where the dollars go. And we know uh, nature of plan gifts, people won't be around to see the good work uh, those dollars uh, do. So allowing them to, to uh, share that with you in that capacity, University of Louisville right there, uh, allow, uh, asking questions on uh, valuing their feedback, getting some input for them, nothing too extensive, but then opening it up to share your story. Uh, we see surveys and, and, and just asking thoughtful, meaningful questions allow people to get to that point of maybe feeling comfortable enough to share that story. Uh, I know one of our uh, longtime clients, uh, the great folks who are with the Daughters of the American Revolution, have, have used a similar concept to get people to tell their story. And they've had been surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised, not only from stories people share digitally, but also stories that people send in. I think they had one individual even send in, uh, I think it was a 16 chapter, 18 chapter book uh, of their story and their interaction with the organization. So again, using some of that context and that reframing uh, when you're trying to get folks to, to, re to engage with you in other ways. Another idea as far as donor involvement or utilizing the ideas of asking smart questions for uh, engagement is within a campaign setting. Uh, when we think of, of plan giving outreach and marketing, we fully know whether it's a stelter study you've read or any other research that's been out there, it's typically around one third of the, uh, the plan giving donors in the United States will ever tell a charity about their plans. So it leaves a full 66% of people that because it's easy, because it's private, because it's their own business, uh, we will find out when we find out. So you always ultimately have to think through how are you engaging, how are you communicating with folks? So we look at it as part air cover, that's the storytelling we do, the impact stories we're sharing, the educational efforts, and then looking at time-bound smart campaigns for those that may be inclined to raise their hand. Uh, we all sit down beginning of the year and look at what are our goals that we want to accomplish and the KPIs and the smart objectives, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound. And looking at, you know, what are campaigns? So this one is an example. Some of you may have seen this. I've shared it a handful of times because I think it was a great uh, use of this concept is the, the good folks out at the San Francisco Symphony uh, utilizing an you know, opportunity for survey and in their context providing fast feedback uh, for information that pertained around a campaign 70 at 70. Their longtime musical director, uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, who had really helped build San Francisco Symphony to the international name it is, was turning 70 and they wanted to uh, take the opportunity for that 12 months of his birth, birthday to honor him. Uh, and as if you followed some of Dr. James research, honor memorial tribute really resonates well when it comes to plan giving. Uh, this campaign, uh, this is just one aspect, they incorporated it in a lot of different areas of their outreach, uh, but allowed them to, to more than double what they found, what they typically find in a year as far as new intentions. So I think they ended up a little over 70, 73, 74 intentions in, in a year when they or an organization typically averages around 30 every year. So again, thinking about other applications for how you can utilize uh, the, the act of surveying or asking smart questions. Uh, the next one that we've seen uh, is, is really around gathering data. Uh, we know uh, as, as fundraisers, as marketers, we can be smarter, we can be more efficient, more effective uh, it, based on the amount or the, the uh, clarity or, uh, of data that we have. So we look at this as the three eyes really. It's kind of the extension of your face-to-face -face discovery, but how have they been involved? How are they involved? Uh, your prospective donor, your donor, you know, how interested are they? Are there certain things that are, they tend to lean towards others, other, uh, from funding priority, from a programmatic standpoint? And then really, what do they consider important? You know, it's one thing us having our initiatives and what's important to us, but we all know it's around connecting that to the donor need and the donor uh, 
uh, uh, want. So, you know, finding, finding is it, uh, is it tax benefits? Is it funding priorities? And what are those things that really resonate? Uh, here's an example of an uh, organization that uh, we did this with a couple of years back, a local organization here in Des Moines, Animal Rescue League. Uh, and you may be able to read some of this on your screen, but they used uh, the idea of surveying uh, at, at the very first onset to glean and gather information around donors on programmatic and funding issues that they had. Uh, you know, their therapists, um, their, their fetch list, a couple other items to really see where people's passion stood. Uh, some of this they may have already known anecdotally, some may have been captured in their database, but this allowed them uh, really from the donor's mouth to get that information and provide that feedback. They then use it as an opportunity to open up to, to other questions around their planning, around things they've done, whether it's with ARL or with other organizations. Uh, you know, asking questions like presumptive, many people like to leave one or more gifts to charity in their will. If you were to sign a will next six months, how likely would you be to include a gift? And then giving them the options, so forth. So again, seeing where they are from a family planning or a general estate planning standpoint. And then ultimately utilizing it to capture demographics. Uh, we all want to identify those folks, and there's different types of screening services out there that allow us to mine our data. Um, but again, you know, I know we've all read some Dr. James stuff. Childlessness is one of the top uh, indicators of a, a plan giving prospect. And ultimately, all the screening services out there uh, still cannot really find that. I know my father was run through a screen a handful of years ago, and uh, I was told he had no children. Uh, yes, he had no children living in his residence, but obviously that is not the case. So there's great ways and great uh, additional information you can glean just from a simple demographic standpoint. Uh, ARL, uh, again, was able to glean some great information and allowed them to use that for some of their other marketing and one-on-one -on -one outreach, uh, but also through this uh, simple campaign. I think they sent out to around 1,400 people, uh, had about 74 new uh, gift intentions that popped up from that. The next use case is really around stewardship. You know, we can make assumptions uh, that we are, are, are doing good by our donors to thank them in a timely manner, that we're being transparent about where dollars are going, uh, that uh, you know, they have trust in how we're utilizing those dollars. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we, as, as every generation changes, people question more and more, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, how we're ranked by uh, Guide Star Charity Navigator, or how uh, media runs with stories, that impacts all of us to some extent. So it never hurts to ask, uh, you know, how are we doing? Uh, are we doing a good job uh, sharing those stories and sharing with you how those dollars are being spent? Um, are there opportunities for us to be better? Uh, we used this with an organization uh, a couple years back, again, a national organization that had a very transactional nature of giving. Uh, if you gave 50 bucks, you received a lapel pin. If you gave 100 bucks, you received a coffee mug. And that was really how things had been for years and years and years. And so we instituted a survey, again, very much built and designed for the plan giving uh, director, but ultimately had application broader to their annual and their major gift program because we've heard loud and clear two things back from a stewardship standpoint. One, most donors did not feel like they were thanked in a timely manner. And that may be perception, that may be reality, but either way, that was what was resounding coming out of that survey. The other side of the coin was they wanted to see where their dollars were going. They wanted to see that the dollars they were giving were going to impact the mission and the programs, and they did not want the tchotchkes. So the organization has subsequently taken this information and has now applied that and eliminated some of the old staid ways that they had had for years and years and years. So there's a great opportunity utilizing surveys to really check the pulse. Uh, you know, again, we've seen this in for-profits for years. You see this with rentalcars.com, other websites. Actually, I've been spending a lot of time traveling this spring and probably have seen a handful of you out at some of the conferences. Uh, but uh, I know more than a couple times as I've landed in, uh, in the city that I'm speaking at, uh, you know, the folks uh, uh, get up on the, on the mic on the airplane Delta and say, uh, hey, you're going to be receiving a survey in the coming days. We strive for five, uh, you know, always looking for that feedback on how are they doing. Uh, not resting on their laurels, and we shouldn't be any different. Uh, the, the fourth one, really, that we kind of look, look at and have found, obviously, you know, a very straightforward success is identifying bequests. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, we all have our portfolios. Uh, you know, that could be 75 folks. That could be 150. Uh, some folks I know have upwards of 200, 225 or so. Uh, you can only see so many people uh, in a given day. You can only see uh, and speak to so many people in a given year. 
Uh, so going back to the YMCA story, you know, what opportunities do we have to throw a wider net and ask some of those questions that can help identify where we stand? Is this even a, a personally I like to be able to qualify out or qualify into a conversation down the road? Uh, so, you know, as an example, things that we can identify very easily, whether it's a digital or print outreach is, you know, has somebody already included us? Have they not had the opportunity or reason to tell us? Uh, potentially, are they inclined to share with us what type of gift or what type of assets they're utilizing for that? And even so, you know, is it split? Are we receiving majority? Are we receiving a portion? That all informs uh, not only our stewardship efforts, our follow-up, our, 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 our relationship building, but also, you know, other aspects in regards to, you know, potentially how those dollars could be used or applied to our programs. And then finally, this is one of my, my favorite uh, use cases that we've seen in the, in the last three years of, of it, uh, doing surveys with our clients is really, and selfishly, growing your pipeline. It's an awesome opportunity because we all know plan giving is largely based. It's not like an annual appeal where we send out a marketing piece and in the next two, three weeks, people send their checks back in. Uh, plan giving doesn't work that way where people are automatically going out and, and updating their will or writing a new will. Uh, so it's all about timing. And so surveys allow a very uh, easy way to hit people when the time's right or at least allow them to tell us when the time would be right. It also allows us uh, from a, a growing your pipeline uh, standpoint to get more feedback to, to allow us to be smarter, not just with our one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face cultivation, but from our marketing outreach too. Uh, so a couple examples allowing us uh, really to find those folks that are here at the right time. Is it something that right now they're ready to talk to or six months or 12 months may be a better time based on what's going on in their life? It allows us to target our marketing. Are we getting information uh, that maybe uh, allows us to reframe or rethink our marketing outreach? Maybe we've been missing uh, missing the the boat in regards to the, the not the audience, but also some of the themes. Uh, allows us to increase our program ROI and, and ultimately saves us time because we're not doing as much educated guessing as maybe we have in the past. Uh, so again, a variety of different things to think about as it relates to those objectives and those uh, use cases that you want, want to be mindful of. The next learning objective, uh, as I talk about objectives, is critical. Uh, it, 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 before you do anything from a survey standpoint, ultimately you want to understand what you're trying to accomplish. It doesn't really do you, your staff, anyone any good if we don't have an idea of ultimately what the, the, the intended or hopeful outcome may be. A uh, couple of the ones that we have seen uh, tend to be these five right here, uh, allowing us, as I've mentioned and spoken to a little bit, uh, to measure donor attitudes and even obstacles. But some people using it prior to launching a campaign and, and just based on questions that have come up when I've shared this data point, I am not insinuating or saying this would be a surveys or a tool to use in lieu of a feasibility study for a campaign. Uh, but I know we're working with a variety of colleges around the country that are in endowment campaigns, and they already have a goal in mind, they have a time frame in mind. You know, surveys can really be a great tool when done correctly to not only identify folks where, yes, in this five-year window or three-year window for a campaign, I'm ready to talk now, or maybe six months or 12 months is a better time. Uh, but it allows us to better qualify because we all have limited time face-to-face, uh, -face, and so we can really, especially in a campaign setting, utilize that time better. It allows us to get in information and insight, as I showed with the ARL example, on uh, donor receptiveness uh, to in program innovations or direction, uh, funding priorities. We've had other organizations, I know a couple of animal rescues out west uh, that have utilized surveys to really help get line of sight on where do they want to spend some of their time and resources. They have these great programs, but are all of them resonating with their core audience? Uh, again, gathering demographics, affinity information prior to starting a plan giving program. We typically see plan giving programs in about three different stages. Uh, there's typically a new program, you know, we've maybe received gifts over the transom, uh, but have never really been able to, to uh, put ink to paper and actually put together a formal outreach effort to our, to our donor and our constituents. So we're looking at, at, at how do we start that. Uh, a lagging program. Um, sadly, we do see quite a few of those, whether it be shift in priorities, shift in uh, transition of, of the development professional or a campaign. Uh, it was started years ago and then really hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, the third type of program we typically see is an innovative or a, a consistent striving or thriving program. You know, how can we do better with what we're doing now? 
So surveys really play a part in each one. If you're starting, it gives you a great baseline to gauge interest and, and really where people's minds are at. And then identifying, uh, you know, where you should go with those outreach. With lagging, it's, hey, you may not have heard from us for a while. We are um, uh, adamant and, and very interested in your feedback and thoughts in regards to some of the things we're doing and, and opening the, the dialogue that way. And then again, with innovating and growing and looking at ways to be more creative with the outreach and engaging folks. Uh, and then the final one, again, building an online pipeline of qualified leads for cultivation. I mentioned that with the use case number five. Um, we've had, we have multiple folks who have utilized this as a great tool to constantly have a drip of folks that they should be talking to. Uh, I know there's a, a, a great school up in the Northeast that we've worked with for years and years, but over the last couple of years has very simply just it, it kind of included surveys as part of their standard operating procedure every quarter. Uh, they don't survey a ton of people every time, but about 500 people every quarter, uh, they drop a digital survey to and they get about 10% response each time, 50 or so folks. And for their two person shop, you know, there's a half a dozen to a dozen that need immediate action. And that is very feasible for them to take action on and follow up with. So it's worked as a great ongoing kind of drip uh, opportunity or effort for them to, to actually uh, identify folks in a timely manner. Next thing really want to, to look at that's important as well, and we'll look at it in a couple different aspects, is benchmarking. Uh, you know, a lot of us talk about benchmarking, talk about, you know, our peer institutions and, you know, our institutions that we uh, strive to, to, to look like and be like. Uh, and surveys can allow some aspect of that, whether it be internal or external. I know uh, when we were first sharing and going through building the questions in the survey platform a couple years back, and again, uh, with Dr. James on the, on, the, on the line here, sharing it with him. And when he was president of uh, Central Christian College in Missouri, you know, he shared with us one of the things that he really loved with what, uh, at that time in his role, uh, getting from Noel Levitz was their admission, their annual admission, uh, admission survey and the benchmarking that that allowed him to see how they stood, where they were at as it related to their peers. So benchmarking can play a couple different roles uh, when you're looking at utilizing surveys uh, for your folks. And we'll look at internal and external uh, for all intents and purposes today. Internal is typically easier for a lot of us. Uh, some of the bullets I put up there is, you know, again, if you are starting to go down this road and haven't done surveys yet, or maybe if you have, you've already done this, is utilizing that first survey as really kind of creating the baseline. You know, that allows you to see from a stewardship standpoint, from an engagement, from a uh, from a, a donor affinity standpoint, are we doing things right? And then every year or whatever the cadence is appropriate, and we'll get into that a little bit later too, you can kind of test against that and refer back. Are we doing well? Do we need to make some in-flight adjustments? What are the things that make sense? Externally, if you are doing surveys, there are you know, you know different types of surveys, so like like Dr. James had access to with Noel Levitz that allow you to survey based on peer groups, and and you can uh, identify you know how am I ranking and how am I standing up based on the folks that look like me, uh, and, and that uh, my organization uh, may resemble. Uh, so a variety of different ways to look at that. Really, a lot of us uh, tend to look at the internal aspect the most because that really is the most applicable uh, when we're we're doing these on our own. Learning objective number three, as we kind of cruise through this today, is, is, is the big question on who. Uh, ultimately, when you're looking at, especially in this context around planned giving, uh, the key is really spending your precious time and the time of your gift officers and frontline folks on the right people and finding those folks. There's obviously tools that we all use between modeling platforms and programs and different algorithms and ranking. Uh, but if we can find those folks that the timing is right, that something has shifted or changed in their life and they're open to sharing that, uh, that works out really well. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, um, you want to avoid spraying and praying. We use spraying and you know, the, the, the idea uh, of spraying and praying, we used to see that a lot with traditional newsletters and emails and things like that. Uh, I met with an organization in the Northeast about a year or two ago, a large international organization, and they had sent a survey out kind of blindly, um, but the 40,000 folks in their database, not all of which were don donors or at least very uh, consistent donors, but had connections to the organization. And while, yes, there were some low-hanging fruit the individual found, he also found himself putting out 
and spending more time putting putting out fires or dealing with folks who provided feedback that wasn't as positive uh, because he hadn't really fine-tuned and honed in on on the right audience so just it's something to be mindful of as you're looking through this so uh, some information to share on kind of just database prep and I shared this with the good folks up at the plane giving group in New York and somebody chuckled in the front row is making sure things are up to date are donor IDs uh, 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 coded correctly, or is the age information, mailing addresses, emails, is everything tight? Have you done a national change of address or even a death registry? And we hate to send a survey to to a loved one who's uh, you know had had individual uh, past years before. Uh, so uh, common sense marketing, but I bring it up because we all deal with it in in, in some rhyme or, or reason. Uh, the other side of it is really looking at um, what you have access to. So have you done an internal model? Have you utilized one of these great firms on the side here? They all do terrific work to help you really mine through uh, your, your, your data file and make sense of where time should be spent. And so starting there and kind of using, if you don't have that, if you haven't done that, budget hasn't allowed you to, obviously, you know, we typically fall back on a, some variation of, of the recency uh, frequency model. And then ultimately narrowing your focus. This comes from objectives largely. What are you trying to accomplish that will inform you know, how you want to narrow this? But for plan giving, we typically want to target smaller groups so that we not only are engaging them in a mindful and meaningful manner, but also allowing capacity to follow up with them. So I'll share some terminology here. Um, if indeed you are looking at using surveys to make some programmatic decisions, I mentioned the uh, Animal uh, Rescue League or uh, Humane Organization out west that was looking at using their survey to make programmatic decisions. So when you're looking at from a scientific standpoint, you do want to be mindful of, of, of some of this terminology. If you're using it again as an opinion survey, this may not uh, be as applicable or ne as necessary, but uh, definitely if you are trying to make it to to, to, to make decisions on program. So population size, pretty straightforward, total number of people in the group you're trying to study. Margin of error is obviously that percentage that tells you how much you can expect uh, your results reflect the views of, of the overall population. And then sample sizes are those folks that actually completed the survey that you can pull from and, and make uh, decisions on. An example of this, just for all intents and purposes, uh, if you're a nonprofit A, you send this out to 2,000 donors, uh, and you would like to have, you know, a confidence level of 90% or more with no less than a 5% margin. Uh, this is the kind of sample size and response you would want. You'd want to make sure if you did the survey 100 times, 90 out of those 100, it would fall within that deviation. So you'd want at least, you know, a little bit less than a 238, but 238 would give you just shy of a 12% response rate. So again, not something you need to worry about a lot if you're using it as a straight uh, opinion survey, but if you are looking at it as a decision-making tool on programmatic things, you do want to make sure it's uh, scientifically uh, significant so you can uh, utilize that with your data folks. Now, finally, we get to kind of uh, learning objective number four here. This is really kind of the meat in regards to how do we go about this? Where do you start? Ultimately, and we see this time and time again, you start talking about a survey and probably a lot of your organizations are doing some variation of an alumni survey or a, a donor engagement survey or something to that effect. And as you start trying to, to whittle in and fine tune it and use this for your needs, uh, everybody wants to put a different question in there. Everybody wants to take a different uh, tweak. So we'll look at things from a messaging standpoint, what's important to think through as you're thinking about the, the words that go in this, the format, you know, when to use certain formats versus others, the mediums as well, and then just some tips and tricks uh, that we've seen uh, that maybe you can apply to your shops. So first and foremost is, is really making that case for feedback. Um, you know, I, I Again, it's kind of a duh in a lot of respects, but you know, if we are reaching out and we're asking people to take some time, and hopefully not a lot of time, but taking some time nonetheless to provide feedback, thanking them first and foremost should be a given. Uh, we want to make sure that they understand the value of, of the survey. You know, so share with them why this is important and, and why this is valued. And at every step, also remind them of privacy. Uh, we do know donor privacy, and I know everybody on the phone does as well, is, is, a, hu is a, a huge uh, thing that we all need to be mindful of, but make sure that at every step they understand this is not something we're sharing with other organizations. This is meant solely to help us be better at what we do and better uh, stewards of, of your time and talents and dollars. Uh, and then I think another reason why surveys have really worked well in our world, in the plan giving world in particular, is because we can make them time bound. 
our donors are just like us. They procrastinate their planning. We visit with them. We share ideas with them. You know, tax reform changes, gift annuity rates change up. And we're constantly giving them ideas, but they procrastinate. They don't want to think about these things any more than, than they need to. And so it's really nice in this type of context to put a date on this. You've sent it via email. You've sent it via snail mail. Uh, for us to make sound decisions and make the most of your feedback, please respond by this time. And that allows us an opportunity to really create a little bit of that sense of urgency that has lacked for so many years in a typical plan giving outreach. Now, I talked about questions earlier, and again, using this as kind of a discovery aspect. It really shouldn't deviate a ton from what you're doing face to face. As you're sitting down with a prospective donor, uh, you know, whether it's the first time or a subsequent time, ultimately you're trying to, to understand why do, why do they care about your organization? Why are they on your radar? What are the things that really personally drive them? What are the things that professionally drive them? What are the things that emotionally, you know, they want to, to, to solve or to support um, uh, with, with some of their, whether it's philanthropy or just their day-to-day -day life. So it's really making it about the donor. It's, see, we have our initiatives. Every organization has, you know, the mandate that comes down. These are the things we need to do. But when you're taking the time and you're asking donors to take their time from a survey standpoint, make it about them and what's important to them, whether it's their interests or their passions and not necessarily us. And emphasize the lasting impact. Uh, you know, those questions that focus on the permanence. Again, following uh, what I really like about some of the things Dr. Dr. James has shared is, is giving, using this as an opportunity to allow somebody to reflect on their life story. We first saw this, you know, I think it was our 2009 bequest study, or maybe our 2012, where we actually, in a 11 minute phone interview, one of the initial questions was, do you know what the word, term plan giving it uh, means? And only about 34% of the people said yes. Over the next 11 minutes, as we talked about the actual vehicles and the tools and a very layperson standpoint, the, the interest level uh, skyrocketed two thirds, where two thirds of the people said, you know, that'd be something I'd be interested in. Uh, and so we know in a short period of time, you can get people to think through things and make decisions and get to a point. So one of the things with surveying that we've seen has worked really well, especially when you're building them, is thinking through that the, the order of events and the cadence. So starting with the questions that are very much more global and affinity and mission focused. What are the things that we're doing that really you know, resonate with you? And then asking, what has your relationship looked like with us? What does it look like now? And what do you see for the future? And that allows them that great opportunity to kind of think through, you know, maybe I'm doing all I could, or maybe I haven't thought about this, or some of those things. So thinking about that and using, allowing them to, to even, you know, reflect back and, you know, who's influenced some of those behaviors or some other philanthropy. And then we're appropriately incorporating some of those legacy questions throughout. Uh, the fourth thing, uh, you know, when you're looking at building a survey, is again, bringing that mind life of family connections. You know, I, I referenced earlier with the, with the, the, the tribute memorial uh, effort uh, that uh, San Francisco Symphony did to pay honor to their longtime musical director, same thing around family. Was there anyone in your life who was particu particularly influential in shaping your views? Uh, what are, what are the, the, the things that resonate? Are there th folks that have, have really driven you to where you're at? Uh, again, I know with some of Dr. James stuff, how, what he's done with the, the neuroimaging study from a couple of years back, you know, the part of the brain where people go to think about some of these legacy and kind of those memories is, is very close and similar to where they, when they're thinking about family, when they're thinking about those loved ones. So tying that in is, is an important thing to be mindful of, too. And then the fifth thing of, to really be mindful of when you're building your survey is, is the method behind the madness. You know, what does that sequencing look like? So I mentioned earlier, how do they care about you? Why do they care about you? What does that connection look like? Are they involved currently? And then always ending up with the demographics. And, you know, that way we can kind of build to that information and then allow them to kind of fill in the gaps uh, at, the, at the back end uh, when, uh, when they've already been hopefully through that thought process and then now thinking of us in a different context. Some tips and tricks, uh, again, with regards to, to what to think through. Uh, selecting a format, you know, obviously for years and years, and when I found that old study, the survey that we did back in the mid 80s, no doubt it was print. Uh, so there's a variety of different ways for us to, to look at when do we use print? When do we use digital? What resonates with, with what folks at what time? Uh, so some of the things we've seen is, is utilizing print survey very much uh, a couple of the things to be mindful of. If you're an organization that is typically or historically built your donor file uh, via uh, print uh, fundraising, 
uh, and communicates with your donors a lot through, through direct mail, you know, you may want to lean more towards a print aspect. You may be already, your donors may be conditioned to receive and connect with you in that capacity. Uh, obviously, you know, if you have limited email addresses or you're not sure of the uh, credibility or efficacy of those email addresses, you know, uh, you would want to typically lean towards print. And then, you know, some of that you can make generalizations. I don't uh, typically, you know, uh, these aren't tried and true, but if, you know, somebody's over 75, 80 years of age, print may be a better option. We know we all have instances of folks that we correspond with in every medium. So, you know, take that one and be mindful that based on what you know about your donor file. From a digital standpoint, really it's kind of the inverse. It's, you know, if uh, you're an organization that your donors have adapted very quickly uh, to communicating with you via digital and supporting you via some of those mediums. If you have a lot of engagement when it comes to some of your email outreach and you're getting click-throughs uh, that, uh, that people are paying attention, you're not necessarily hitting them over the head every five minutes with, a, with another email. Uh, again, if your email addresses are updated, if you feel uh, good about uh, how accurate that data is, yes, digital makes the most sense. Ethan, I'm in the um, pause for just a minute. It, it's at least here where I'm at. Uh, your audio just went dead. So I'm going to go ahead and switch. Yes, and I'm getting some notes from other people that they lost your audio. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to pause and we'll, we'll get that fixed for you. All right. Well, um, give me a thumbs up on the text uh, screen if you can hear me now. Apologize about that. Not sure what's happened uh, with the audio there we go all right uh, so uh, hopefully uh, we just kind of ducked out there as i was getting to the question around how often uh, should you survey your donors and it really again depends back to the objective what have you set out to accomplish are there other surveys going on from your organization are there other uh, things that are happening in your organization that may impact uh, a survey response fatigue and so forth uh, a couple things that we look at and i'll bring this up on the screen here uh, uh, donor satisfaction, annual giving, major plan for, again, for, for, for needs today. Donor satisfaction, you probably, to some extent, your organizations are doing this in some way, um, whether that's after an event, whether that's uh, after an appeal, there, you know, is a, a reach out to, again, affirm or, or reconfirm uh, that we're, we're uh, doing the things we need to do to make sure they feel comfortable with uh, their experience, their gift. Uh, if you're doing a more substantial donor satisfaction survey, I know Stelter, we typically outsource a client satisfaction survey every two years. We're always checking the polls, obviously, with our clients. Uh, hopefully, some of you on the phone are feeling that way. Uh, but every two years, we outsource a professional um, uh, anonymous study to really get a gauge on, you know, are we doing the things that, that really are helping everybody uh, be successful? So that, uh, you know, again, depending on the length of that donor satisfaction uh, survey, uh, you may be more frequent or maybe a, maybe a, a every other year. Annual major plan, really we see nothing more than annual or about 18 months, 12 to 18 months typically. You don't want to hit people over the head with surveys. Uh, if survey fatigue is a thing, I know there are some large national charities that have been doing surveys for years and years, and they are getting feedback and pushback from folks saying, uh, you know, I'm constantly getting asked for information and, and so forth. Hopefully you have everything you need from me by now. So you do want to be mindful. We know plain giving in particular is a low incident activity. Uh, so while you send a survey out to a thousand people, you get a hundred to respond. You know, there's a 900 that that didn't hit them at the right time. So, you know, in the next 12 months or so, there may be an opportunity to re-engage them. Uh, some other things is around timing considerations. Uh, again, I know this question came in before the, the webinar started is, you know, what is the perfect time to send a survey? There is not a magic time to send a survey. We have, we've had this question for years and years when it comes to newsletters and emails and every type of communication you do. There's not a, a magic time to send these. There are, however, times to avoid. Uh, so obviously, depending on your organization, you know, are you in a, a time of turmoil or, or conflict? Is there a lot of communication already going out? So you do want to be mindful. You want to work with your teams internally. Uh, we have seen from a calendar standpoint, November to January is a, is a time to avoid surveys. 
Uh, you may most definitely identify folks and get people to engage, uh, but for the time and resources and energy you're spending on it, you won't necessarily get the biggest bang for your buck. Obviously, immediately after holidays, um, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, making sure it doesn't get lost in other clutter of other mail that may be going out. Uh, the other thing to do, and this is just for every marketing, we all know that, but as long during political campaigns, uh, you know, we do know we need to be mindful uh, of some of that when we are, are doing that in the, in the coming years here. Uh, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but I do want to bring it up because I know we've got about nine, ten minutes left here, and I know we have a couple questions here we want to uh, address. Uh, but it is important to, to be mindful of, of, of survey bias, and this isn't necessarily done on purpose, uh, but it typically happens in the design of the survey. And so here's some tips in regards to how to avoid this when you and your team are putting these things together. I'll bring these up and kind of walk one through uh, uh, one by one through the wording of the questions. First and foremost, it does you no good to use the term planned giving in your surveys. We do not want to use our industry jargon. Uh, I, again, you know, nine times out of ten, we've all had those experiences when somebody asks us what they do. We say planned giving, and you know, we see their eyes glass over. So donors are, are not dissimilar. So be mindful of the type of jargon and the wording that you're using. Uh, the question type or the question design. Uh, be mindful of the types of questions and then uh, what, what types of questions work for what you're trying to accomplish. So is it a rating scale? And if it is a rating scale, are those, uh, are those uh, parameters equal? Do you have very unlikely uh, and very likely? Do you have likely and unlikely? Does everything balance out? Uh, and then when and why to use open uh, uh, questions versus close. Close allow us to do a lot of aggregate uh, but uh, open uh, allows us to get some of that candid feedback. Uh, structure, as far as survey structure, the order, as we spoke about earlier, uh, starting broader affinity, passion related, moving into relationship, both past, current, and future, and then ending up on demographics. Survey length, we found really uh, about 16 questions uh, tends to be the, the right structure. Obviously, we've done smaller ones, but really we found a lot of nice response through that. And then style, survey style or coloring. You know, we have a great design team here, and ultimately they want to make things look inviting and warm and welcoming. Uh, but you do not want to accidentally uh, skew results by on one page of your survey having a picture of campus or uh, the football team or whatever that may be, because right, wrong, or different, that may accidentally pull people's attention more to those questions than maybe the questions on the previous page. So there's a reason why surveys typically don't look overly exciting, and it's very much for that reason, as we want to maintain as much uh, consistency uh, through the, the questioning as we can. Uh, survey fatigue, talked about that a little bit. Don't over-survey. Again, be mindful of how you're communicating the value. Uh, keep those questions uh, very clean and easy and to the point, uh, and then ultimately being very relevant to the donor. Uh, make sure, again, it, that it, it does speak to, to your audience. And then the fifth one, as we kind of get closer to the end here and get to some questions, uh, thanks for staying with us with some of the, the audio uh, hiccups, but it is really the, the plan for follow-up. It is crystal clear, not when your survey finishes to create a plan, but as you're going down the process of, of building your survey, what is that plan for follow-up? The worst thing you can do is engage your donors and, and get great feedback from them, and then they never hear from you again. And in fact, one of my earlier uh, trips earlier this spring out to Boston, I was on my flight back speaking to a gentleman next to me, and he is at the end of a 30 year career in uh, technology and sharing he and his wife uh, were looking at uh, some organizations that were near and dear to them. And he had recently in the last six months taken a, a survey that he received from a charity and it took him an hour to fill out. It was a very extensive uh, survey, but he and his wife cared about the organization. So they took the time and then submitted it, did not hear anything back. Uh, he has subsequently, actually in just the previous weeks to, uh, leading up to that flight, had received another request to take a smaller survey, which he ended up throwing in the garbage. So again, yes, we, you really need to, if we're going to ask people to take time, you have to be mindful about uh, what that uh, follow-up process is. So first and foremost, I put, pick up the phone. You know, even though we're in the digital age and email and text and every different aspect of communications available to us, you may be doing your survey via digital but pick up the phone. If somebody has shared they've done something, if somebody says they want to be contacted, uh, give them a call. Can you follow up with a letter? Can you call, follow up with an email? Most definitely, but pick up that phone. 
uh, upload your results. I put this here uh, because, uh, and after kind of picking up the phone, because we have had organizations where you know, they uploaded their results because their database people and, and their research folks wanted that information ASAP. What was lost was they lost uh, weeks in being able to identify those folks who they needed to follow up with. So do that first skim, identify based on whatever survey tool you're using, who the folks are you need to be in front of right now, and then make sure that information gets uploaded into your files for future use. Check your changes. This is an awesome, you know, again, uh, getting that of those organic updates. There's no easy way to find email addresses. There's no easy way to find some of that demographic information. So immediately when you get that feedback from folks, they care about you. And they may have said no, they haven't done anything, or they're not interested at that point, but if they're updating uh, the information that you're providing, if you're pre-populating that response mechanism, which we suggest, uh, make sure that you're, you're making those changes accordingly. Uh, schedule next steps, uh, most definitely. Some folks, this may be the right time. Some folks, it may be more uh, six months or 12 months. Make sure those are on your tickler file so you can be in front of them and help where you can. Ultimately, some of these leads, some of this information you're going to be sharing with your other frontline gift officers, uh, with your marketing team. So make sure you can help to, uh, you know, connect the dots for them that may not be as familiar with some of this. Um, make a determination. What I mean by this is, again, as you get some of that feedback, there's going to be some, some nuggets that may impact marketing. It may impact some of the stuff that maybe you've done the same way for a while. I think it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to take that information and then make determinations on should we tweak, should we make in-flight changes, should we test, are there things that we should be doing a little bit differently. And I mentioned the phone call is the first one. I always say to anybody who responds, we need to send a note. Uh, whether they've said they haven't done anything or aren't interested in this time, acknowledging that they have taken the time to at least send it back to us and provide that feedback. Finally, and again, kind of a dub, but I, I leave you with some of this, is share your results. You know, this may be something you're doing just within the confines of your plan giving department or your team, but make sure everything is being communicated up, sideways, downwards, all over the place. Board of directors, there may be some great, uh, depending on the types of questions you're asking, data points to share with them that they can use with their peers. Same with the C-suite. Uh, marketing team. I mentioned that earlier. You know, what ha maybe marketing is uh, is doing some different things that, uh, that some of your input from your donors uh, uh, may better inform. Um, annual major gift officers. I know uh, we 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 found this out doing a, a plan giving targeted survey for a school out in the uh, uh, out in the east where they saw the application from the input they were receiving right away and said, hey, this isn't just for our PGOs. This is for everybody. So they brought uh, their other teams in to kind of look at it. Obviously, your frontline folks. And then I say ambassadors. What I mean by ambassadors is all of us have those those donors, those uh, av uh, avid uh, um, those advocates, those volunteers that, that love the organization, love the work you do. And another great relationship stewardship standpoint is to bring them in the fold on what you're seeing and hearing. They may be able to provide more context to some of those broader aggregate answers. They may be able to even take some of that and apply it to some of their own philanthropy. So this uh, hopefully concludes. We've got about a minute or two. Thank you. Almost everybody stayed with us through some of those uh, glitches, but uh, hopefully you picked up some tips, some ideas that you can apply to your shops on you know, where to use these, how to set objectives. Again, really thinking, being mindful of who to talk to and, and then creating uh, the right cadence and words and, and obviously the plan that you have for follow-up. I will pass it to uh, well, actually, I'm not passing it over to Jen. We're just the one phone. We're going to go ahead and just be on speaker. All right. So first of all, I just wanted to let um, everyone know we had a lot of questions come in about the slides. I will be posting those to stelter.com backslash webinars along with the recording. It will be there by Monday, and I will be sending out an email when that is available, so check for that there. Uh, we just had a couple questions um, on the webinar information. We have some that are more specific to Stelter services, and we can reach out to you specifically about that. Um, so Nathan, one question um, that Anna has is she wants to ensure that surveys, the survey going out is authentic and that the recipients don't feel like you're prying or mining for information. Do you have any um, thoughts about that? And you can use your headset. I'll switch back. Oh, all right. 
Uh, good question, Anna. Uh, yeah, and this has come up a couple times. Obviously, authenticity is key. I mean, that's when I talk about making sure it's meaningful, making sure it's 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 crystal clear to the the donor on the intent and the reason you're asking. Um, I think a lot of this is set up in, in if you're doing it via email, uh, you're sending an email invitation and making the case. Uh, if you're doing it via print, uh, inevitably you're sending a cover letter. So it's very much it, talking to why and how this will impact the organization. Uh, it, again, part of that comes down to the wording of the questions too. Uh, anybody who's taking a survey knows that the organization is trying to gather information. Uh, so I wouldn't put too much time, energy, and trying to mask uh, questions. I, I think it's always best to be as straightforward as possible uh, with those questions. And then again, where appropriate, you don't want to do a lot of open-ended questions because it's harder to gather and, and aggregate if you're trying to make some broader decisions on it. But you know, where some of those questions may be uh, you know, a little more sensitive potentially, allow open-ended uh, for folks to, to, uh, to get that feedback. Uh, another quick question I see here, and I know Jen has one queued up too, um, but uh, there's one here that Marissa put on here for what resources would you recommend for planning a survey of this nature? Uh, I know Jen mentioned our website where we archive our um, webinars on that same, uh, kind of that same area of our website is where the research papers are. And I know Dr. James, we posted uh, one of his presentations on creating and building surveys. And so I know that's a great resource others have utilized too. Um, I would also probably network with your peers uh, inevitably, especially as we all know in the, in the fundraising world, it doesn't make sense to, to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so also talk to your peers and see who's uh, had success with what. Okay, one more question. Um, Joseph is wondering, they've sent, they have an appeal going. It's gone out to 25,000 households. Most of those people do not give. Do you have suggestions for surveying the people that did not give or have never given to the appeal? And um, he's thinking they probably aren't going to give, so he's wanting to ask their opinion on that. Do you have thoughts on that, Nathan? Sure, uh, yeah, Joseph. Uh, again, most definitely when you're trying to identify the folks, and there's a lot of different ways that people can position it and build surveys. Uh, if you're going to be asking specifically about their relationship with the organization, uh, it's okay to broaden that and to talk about are there other ways, do they come to certain events, are they volunteering, are they doing a variety of other things to kind of capture uh, some of those those folks that may not have actually written a check. You know, I know one of the studies we commissioned back in uh, 2012 was around the ladder of engagement. What does a plan giving person or plan giving donor look like? How do they get there? And 59% of people typically fall in that I've given 10 plus years, uh, some variation of 10 years of giving. Uh, but there is another 20% uh, uh, and 21% of people, 20% that had given uh, less than five years, but 21% of people had never written a check, but had made a plan gift for that organization in mind. So you may have folks out there that haven't written a check, uh, haven't given, uh, but if you use some of that line of questioning to broaden it around engagement, uh, you may be able to bring them and connect them into to different aspects of your program. Okay, thanks, Nate. We are gonna go ahead and wrap up. We're a couple minutes over and we wanna be respectful of your time. So if you do have a question that did not get answered, you can feel free to reach out to Nathan. His uh, email address is on the screen. You can also reach out to me. You can visit our website at stelter.com um, and then Finally, as I mentioned, the resources will be available on our website by Monday, and I will send out an email letting you know once they are available. It's stelter.com backslash webinars. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And if you're um, interested in our webinar one week from today with Dr. Russell James, please head to our website and go ahead and get registered, and hopefully we see you uh, next week. Thanks so much, Nathan, and everyone have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.